So, sir, thank you so much for taking your time and you know doing this podcast with us. We are extremely excited and we'll be looking forward to this engagement with you. Uh, you had a very very rich experience in textiles, working with some of the largest names in the industries in like very critical roles, especially as a CEO. So the idea of doing this podcast with you is to kind of understand from your experience, your learning, your journey, mein, kis tarah ki aapki journey rahi hai, and usse hamara jo textual audience hai, jo ye podcast sunega, wo kaise isse predict ho sakte hai, ya wo kaise isse kuch na kuch seekhi unke business mein kuch implement kar sakte hai, kuch unke business mein badlaav ya kuch sudhar la sakte hai. Sure, sure, sure. My pleasure. So, before we begin the podcast, sir, sabse pehle hamare listeners ke liye. जर्नी After one year, somehow I could not uh, adjust with that one year, so I quit my job basically, and oh. then I joined a uh, two years full time uh, management program, which I passed out in nineteen ninety three from TIT Bhiwani. Uh, the program name was Master of Management Science MMS. After MMS in nineteen ninety three uh, until now. I have worked with a few uh, large group like uh, Rajasthan Spinning and Weaving Mills Limited, Donier Group, and Bombay Dyeing. Majorly, the three companies where I spent uh, most of my time. And in two thousand sixteen, a kind of uh, I had some kind of entrepreneurial aspiration in my mind. So probably to fulfill that, I quit my job and I started my own consulting company. So since two thousand sixteen, I run my company and uh, I'm a self-employed. Okay, that's so good to know, sir. Yeah. So, uh, if you could give us a quick walkthrough of the different companies you've been with and in what positions you've been in, so which company, how many years, and what was your engagement with that company? I mean, in what capacity? Yeah. So, uh, as I told you, majorly three companies. I spent most of my uh, time. as a full time employee and still after quitting the job last 7 years also some of these companies i have done uh, and still doing the consulting part also so okay. from 1993 to 1997 i was uh, with uh, rswm group uh, for their uh, export business of uh, fabric suiting fabrics mayur suitings and uh, then uh, another large area was in uh, donier group where i worked uh, i joined as a general manager exports in 1998 and i worked there till 2009 and i quit in 2009 when i was working as a ceo and i was taking care of three uh, major areas which was yarn dye shirting uh, ready made uh, garment and supplying of the fabric to rng segment so uh, that was the 11 long years i worked with uh, donier and from 2011 to 2016 i was uh, working as a ceo for bombay dyeing and uh, taking care of their textile business okay thank you so much for sharing your textile journey with us sir and yeah. with that if you could give us some insights about you yourself as an individual So how did let's say how did your textile journey began? Did you have a family background in textiles? How did no, you end up in no. this industry? <laughs> no, my uh, journey to the textile industry, I think I have to go four years prior to that because I started working in the industry in nineteen ninety, but my fate was sealed in nineteen eighty six when I got into textile technology course, uh, because. Uh, one of the reason was that uh, i had a family composition some sort of things but at the same time uh, colors weaves fashions these these are the some of the element which always attracted me and very honestly i have always wo- enjoyed working in the textile industry although many people may not agree that in this industry is a very stressful and other things but i have always enjoyed working in this industry 
And as I told you that due to some family compulsion, I had to uh, get myself admitted into textile course in 1986. Uh, there was some financial constraint. Uh, but honestly, that point of time, I had no idea about the industry. Neither the uh, how the industry... When you choose Pardon? textile engineering, how did you decide to textile engineering? Haan, so 1986, when I thought about textile engineering, so, pehle soch to tha 80% due to my family compulsion, the financial constraints, because uh, some other places where I was getting it, I didn't have any funds for sending it to my father's funds. And the college was in the same place where my native place is also, the Behrampur. So, it was a kind of a, these things, but I had some liking for the textile always, uh, maybe since my school days or early college days. So somehow I got admitted in 18, 1986 into textile engineering course. It was a four years full-time course. But honestly, I did not have any idea about how the industry operates, the future growth prospects, nothing. Uh, the only thing I knew was that, that the person who, who, who becomes a textile engineer from this college get the job quickly without sitting idle. And that point of time, my family priority was that I must get a job immediately to support my family. So my entry to the textile engineering was like that. And once you become a textile engineer, even in those days, you, you become um, or you do MMS or MBA, but still other industry uh, did not uh, have that kind of open mind to take them. So my natural choice was to go into the textile industry. Right, I think textile and industry, at least during from the 60s to 80s, or maybe till 90s, also was one such industry which attracted a lot of attention, a lot of wealth. Yes. I think most wealthy families in India today are yes. the ones which actually have a textiles background, you know, yes. to begin with. Yeah, so, so, sir, just to plug in a you know, slightly more candid question now, uh, if you could go back in time. Would you still do this textile engineering or would you wish you would have done something different? Uh, no. I believe that uh, uh, what was I was destined and I, as I told you that I have enjoyed working here. Um, and it, there is no point at this time that had I done something else or something. Else. But one thing is very sure is that uh, after the IT boom came into India post-1990, uh, the good talents, they have been migrated from uh, other other stream of the engineering to the IT area. And yeah, yeah. in the last 30 years, the uh, good talent scarcity is there in the industry. So that is one of the things. But definitely, I think I am destined to do this. And I have tried to do whatever best manner I could do and I'm happy what I am doing today. Love your answer. So very well said. So uh, since you've been CEO of many such large established textile companies, uh, in your opinion, and I'm asking this question because India and especially Indian textile is largely unorganized, largely decentralized. 80 to 85 percent is SMEs. So in your opinion, what are the key factors that differentiates an SME from a large company? I mean, why? Are these smaller companies able to scale or come to a level of a large established uh, organization? And especially, uh -huh. especially that we've known that there was a time when India was filled with large textile companies, large composite units. Uh, I believe we had more than 800 plus uh, textile composite units, Birla Century being the largest in Asia. But I think we've, we've slightly had a reverse trend there that now the number of composite units is much, much lesser and it's become more of a decentralized sector. Yeah. Uh, you see, uh, till uh, 1991, uh, or rather even up to 2002, uh, all large companies were post-independence, they were all protected. Uh, the large composite units uh, were, were highly protected uh, because of several uh, reasons, the government policy and uh, the quota regime and all these kind of things. So, uh, and, 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 the, and the market was whatever the mill will manufacture, 
those products will be sold in the market because uh, the Indian consumers did not have the luxury of seeing the world through digitally or through physical means. So whatever the males used to make, uh, those uh, the consumers have to select among them. Uh, but after 1990, when the domestic, uh, the arrival of, let's say, uh, the uh, ZTV or the satellite TV, gradually the Indian population started understanding that there is a different world altogether. That is point number one. Point number two, uh, in 1991, uh, during the economic liberalization, uh, the government first time allowed the import of secondhand looms. Now, if you see the major boom of textile weaving sector came after 91, 1991, because then many small entrepreneurs, the typical SMEs, could afford to import secondhand looms, which could be one-tenth of the uh, fresh price, and could establish a small unit of 10 looms, 12 looms, 24 looms. And once that started in 1991, for, for the next 10 years, this industries or these companies gradually uh, becoming a threat to the large composite unit because all these years they have never faced such kind of people. And when a typical owner-driven company came up, they came up with a better uh, product or competitive product. So anyway, sir, uh, thank you for sharing how you, know, you ended up in textiles. Uh, my next question to you is regarding the current scenario. How would yeah. you describe the current scenario of Indian textile industry, especially in economic terms? Uh, you see, what I feel is that the current we currently we are standing in a kind of a crossroad, where at one side there are a lot of opportunities, at the same time there are huge challenges also. Because the market dynamics have changed yeah. tremendously in the last few years. Now, if we talk about, let's say, export market. Now, we are steadily growing in export. And recent, as you know, the policy of all international customers, that China plus one, yes. that will really help India or Indian um, exporters. And that will open a huge door for us. And also the another important impetus in this year is the PLI scheme. So China plus one and PLI, these two things will happen uh, in terms of very advantage situations to our industry members. And if we talk about in export for the challenges is that, uh, of course, we are talking about uh, the shifting of business from China to India, but still meeting the price of China quick turnaround time, ability to handle very really large orders, consistency in quality, product innovation. Now, these are the, some of the challenges where industry and every, each and every member have to, has to think of that how we can overcome these challenges to capitalize the opportunities which has been created due to China plus one and PLI. Now, I think one of the area where we need to give a bigger attention and focus is the setting up of larger garment factories and use of more synthetic based fabrics and garments instead of our tri traditional dependency on a cotton products. So one area where definitely uh, we are not as big when people place an order in Vietnam, in, in Bangladesh or China or uh, Philippines or Sri Lanka, uh, the capacity of the garment uh, uh, manufacturer and exporters are much more higher than uh, India. Uh, we are still a country which is probably a fabric-driven country, you not know, the, the finished goods. And we are a country where we are driven mostly by the cotton products rather than synthetic. And if you see the PLI scheme, PLI scheme is more encouraging in the synthetic part of the business. Right. Now, coming to the domestic front, if we talk about domestic front, you see, we can see there is a clear shift currently. Now, if we see 12, 20 years before, the sale of the fabric over the counter, vis-a-vis -vis today, the sale now that has declined or shrinking or stable, but our sale of the ready-made garment, ready-made apparel has increased in Indian scenario. So, over-the-counter business is facing stiff challenges. 
and growth of garments are really predominant nowadays. At the same time, the typical organized sector is feeling the heat because now the cluster-based semi-organized or unorganized sectors are also coming up with a very good quality product and attractive prices and they offer many distribution channel friendly sales policies where the large corporate become little stringent and little become very stubborn there's no this is the policy how we want to work and against that the new generation companies the small companies are much more uh, flexible much more adaptive to the situation but I think for the medium to long term basis, the key for survival and success will be product development is one area definitely one has to work on. Distribution channel will play a very key role. Reach across the globe or within India till you reach the pin code of India and customer servicing. So product development, distribution channel, reach and customer servicing, those four things will play a very major role in the coming days. And this philosophy or this fundamental is applicable for both apparel segment as well as home textile segment. Now, technical textile is very rapidly growing in India and definitely with a clear focus and development with proper supporting ecosystem, including of the big players with a higher investment, government policies, if we do all these three, four things rightly, this segment will have a very bright future in the coming days. Very well summarized, sir. I think how you holistically described the scenario and the opportunity while also presenting the challenges to kind of grant those opportunities, yeah. very, yeah. very well stated, sir. So, yeah. uh, you know, since you've worked with many textile companies has also handled many product launches, uh, what would be your suggestion to some of our listeners in terms of strategies for a product launch, considering both domestic as well as international textile markets? Yeah. Uh, you see, many people before launching the products, we do a lot of due diligence and it should be. I am not against of that. We should have a thorough market study uh, before the launching of the product. But... I go, I want to go one step further backward. The simple and basic mantra that before, because once I am in a position to launch the product means I have already decided the product, what to launch. And then I'm trying to take all possible measures and steps that my launch becomes successful. Fair enough. But one should go one step backward and think that what the customer pain point is. So the simple and basic mantra here is to identify first the customer pain points. What are the gaps in the market? And even how to create a sense of delight in the mind of the customer. So first one should see the customer pain point. For example, you might have understood the pain point in terms of the yarn trading part. And you wanted to make a simplify, you wanted to make a simplified transparent system. So you understood a pain point. You understood there is a gap in the market. And by the, any new means, you, your intention and endeavor would be how I can make our customer delightful. So I think the basic thing is that how we find the pain point or understand the pain point, find the gaps and how we can make our customer delighted. Now, while every customer segment around the world looks for value for money, uh, so every, every customer around the globe will say, my market is very price sensitive. You have to give me the best price. But you also understand that every customer, the same segment is ready to pay more if your product gives them a solution to their current problem or even gives them a delightful experience beyond their imagination. When Apple phone came in 2007 around, or eight probably, there were already uh, several phones, uh, the hardware available in the market. But first time the consumer got a sense of delightness uh, using the Apple phone. So that is a kind of a path breaking uh, strategy. Now, if we watch carefully, 
including your company, all recent startups are more or less based on these principles. So I feel that any textile product launch, be it domestic or international, the feature should be the same, that we should have something extra, be it aesthetically, be it uh, functionally, or a comfort wise. So if we do our that part pro proper homework, even during the launching of the product or distribution of the product in the initial stage, there is a hiccups, but the product really has a attributes to play. Definitely, uh, we can overcome all the hurdles. So basically, you have to be consumer first. Consumer ke putte nazar rakte hue, fir product design karo, and exactly. then think about what is the value you want to offer. Yes, yes. If we if we if we if we try to follow as a kind of what we call vedchal, that everybody is making two thirties two thirties strawberry fabric, and it is probably sold in India every month a few crore meter. So why can't I? produce another 50,000 or 5 lakh meter and try to sell, you may get a top line, but then you won't be able to sustain in a long term. No value creation, then you say that you are competing ah, on ah, price. Ah, ah, ah. And yes. I think the iPhone example that you've given is a very right reference point for us. And within textiles yeah. also, there are companies which are commanding a slightly more price premium. Yeah. And the reason why consumers are paying a price premium is because they have certain assurance or perception of better quality or consistency of quality. Correct. So correct, there correct. are other attributes attached to the product which allows the customer to be wanting that product and also be willing to pay a premium for that. Very true. Well said. So, so, so understanding the pain point, providing a solution, providing a convenience, you see, many startup companies today, all the food app delivery or the grocery app delivery, what they are doing, they are they, they are not creating something extra. They are they are giving a solution to your problem in terms of convenience. So today, yeah. on on a on a click of a button of your mobile phone, today the companies are delivering grocery in a ten minutes time to your home. Otherwise, you have to go out in the market, spend some time. You are already getting late for the office. Still, your wife wants to go and bring something. All those days have gone because somebody somewhere have thought of that kind of a pain point and designed something which can provide solution to this pain point. So we are in Bangalore now, and I can tell you that I need to deliver for most of these apps, whether it's a Zepto or a Blinket or you know a Swiggy Instamart, is under five minutes. Yeah, yeah, I know. On the path, sade cha, paachir me, you deliver karo. As you said, you are delivering convenience, so it's a supply chain business. And yes. talking about textiles, where we've historically always struggled to deliver our customers' orders, which originally they had a thirty days or forty five days lead time, also getting delayed. So it's Very a supply good. chain, and I think one of the things that personally I see in the industry is that there actually are not rules for supply chain in the industry. The moment yes. we start having supply chain related roles, now we'll be able to solve for this timeliness or delivery related problems. Correct, correct, correct. Very true. So, so since we're talking about uh, you know product launches and you know you've given some great insights on that, uh, which textile segment, in your opinion, will see good or great growth in the next five or seven so years? I wish I I could tell you the exact. Uh, a name or the number uh, so it is very difficult to pinpoint exactly however i can give a, my viewpoint uh, see in the indian segments indian market if i talk about some segments will be growing faster in terms of percentage because relatively they have a low baseline so definitely in terms of percentage you will find a bigger percentage and some segments uh, will be growing uh, more in terms of absolute value so uh, if, if I talk to listeners, what you are saying is that like, any industry where the market size is smaller, the casual can be much larger compared to an industry which has a much larger size. Of course, unka jo hai, so Jinka already sale come hai, jiska baseline come hai, jo segment ka, us segment may aapko doso become char so means hundred percent growth. So percentage wise, there will be hundred percent growth. But Joe segment में already 50,000 crore का business है, वो अगर 60,000 भी करता है, तो भी 20% growth होता है. 
Correct. So, so we have to measure the growth from the two different angles. So let's talk about the first area, the percentage growth. Now, in my view, uh, the the items or the segment will have a higher percentage growth, like one is a technical textile, definitely. In a retail front, my viewpoint is that make to measure segment of the fabric business because uh, gradually that segment is growing because of a particular customized feet or, 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 or uniqueness in terms of uh, designs or uh, the fabrics. So make to measure segment of the fabric business, I feel, will grow faster. Ethnic wear, definitely, both fabric and garment. So that is something where the growth percentage will be definitely higher. Stretch feature-based fabrics and garments. So nowadays, if you uh, go to a ready-made uh, apparel shop and you'll say most of the uh, uh, garments or the trousers, for example, be it 100% cotton or poly wool or uh, denim, uh, most of the products are having this stretch feature because today rigid fabric sale is go going down, down, down and stretch is coming up very very strongly. And then there's a new segment we call athleisure. So athletic and laser, so that is a segment which I feel will be growing faster in the coming days Inst against our traditional segment like uh, polyvisco suiting or cotton shirting or bedded bath, this kind of thing. So these three, four segments in terms of today, their baseline is relatively lower, but in terms of percentage growth, next five years, their growth will be much faster. Now, if we talk about international market, I feel the better growth will be observed in poly wool segment, both the poly wool yarn and poly wool fabrics. Once again, the stretch is uh, doing very good in international market and fabric and garment made out of recycled polyester because of the green and the circularity movement and in, th in the area of bed linen uh, i am sure uh, in the area of home textile the bed linen will also be growing faster although the segment is not doing well for last one to one and a half year but i strongly feel that this segment will be bounced back very soon and this time it will be not only 100% cotton uh, for which uh, Indian suppliers are identified in international market, but also 100% polyester, uh, micro polyester based uh, fabric of bed sheets where China was very strong all these years. Uh, I am sensing there will be huge growth in that area also. Okay. It's quite wonderful how you've segregated the growth and percentage growth and product growth and you've kind of elaborated on the different areas that, you know, would grow. Thank you so much for enlightening us, sir, with that. Uh, again, we all know uh, that, you know, as you also initially said, that India was a growth aayata, a small policy change, as you that we were allowed to import a second machinery. So, when you were high showing entry barrier, tha, Apex mein wo chala gaya, which this is a growth aya. So a lot of times government policies are very important. So what right. are your views on government policies and how do you see you know any changes in, in, in the same with respect to textile industry now? Uh, you see, um, many times uh, we criticize government that government has not is not doing anything, not done anything, but I am not of that category. Now, government, when we it runs the country, they have different priorities and they have to see as a, a holistic approach. But still, I feel that government has done time to time as they have brought new policies and which have helped our textile industry. And, and I'm sure that they will keep on doing this. The reason being government is fully aware of the importance of our industry. Uh, in terms of employment generation or retention, um, in terms of bringing valuable foreign exchange or our industry's contribution to the GDP of the country. And if we see the past trend for, let's talk about last 30 years from 1991 to till now, many positive initiatives government has taken. As I told you earlier, that import of secondhand looms in early 90s was one of the path breaking idea and followed by textile mega park, cluster development, um, different initiative by central and state governments uh, for setting up uh, the greenfield projects or brownfield projects, different time of export benefits, and the recent PLI scheme. So 
in yeah. last 30 years, if we see several policies time to time as per the need of the industry uh, to make the industry more competitive, both domestic and international market, government has brought the new policies. The only area where I feel that if government can do little extra is, the, is to rationalize its labor policy. Um, because I truly believe that government should do it with a more open uh, outlook, keeping in mind the competition within India and also competitive uh, countries. Because if we want to compete in terms of price, in terms of delivery, uh, definitely our productivity uh, has to increase and productivity can increase uh, both in terms of installing good machines, but at the same time, our human resource and our approach uh, to that human resource in terms of uh, delivering better results and uh, as per the need of the customer. So I believe that is an area where um, there has government has done something. I'm not saying that they have not done anything. But I feel that uh, more rationalized and more um, liberalization is needed on that area. Apart from that labor uh, rationalization area, there are certain areas like uh, power tariff. Uh, that is one key area or the finance cost or encouraging sustainability and even faster refunds of all government incentives. Because many times our industry friends uh, feels that all sort of incentives which they have already considered in their costing and sold the goods uh, do not come on time and as a result their cash flow gets impacted badly so i believe that these are the few steps if government uh, can look into our uh, industry colleagues will be an industry friends will be much more competitive very good sir and if i may or uh, you know you mentioned about cash flow i think most people in the industry are aware that especially export ki baat kare, a lot of businesses have been built on the incentives where the cash flow issues have been very severe because the amount of time it is taken for those incentives to come back has been very large. Yeah. Uh, having run large businesses as CEOs, you know, some of the very well-known names, do you think that is the right practice to build business? Uh, um, can you repeat your question, please? So, I mean, is it the right way to build business where you factor in subsidies or the, the limits that you may get and factor it in your price and then, you know, the delays of, the, the you know, the money coming back to you causing oh, cash flow problems? It is a double whammy, very honestly speaking. Because if there are 10 competitive companies are doing the costing and the profitability calculation under one X system, and if I want to be Y, and if I do not want to follow them, then my quote will be uncompetitive. So the important thing is that if I do not believe of any type of incentives. So if incentives has to go away, let it go away. All the people will develop their own strength and they will do the business as per the merit. But the problem is that if government is giving incentive and all industry, my peer group is considering those things in their PNL in their cash flow. Uh, and if that point of time, if I do not consider this, uh, then I have to induct uh, more cash into the business. And uh, if I include those things, and if I do not get it on time, then definitely it has a pressure on my cash flow. So, so uh, yeah, please carry on. Uh, well, I, I get your point, what you're saying. You're not your price is not competitive. Yes. Yes. Then yes. you may have to do the profit, but to do that. Yes. 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 Right. And you know, since we've been speaking about machinery and all of that, uh, how can one seek investment for his or her textile business? What are the different ways you know that you can suggest in terms of you know investment? Because textile, largely, if we talk about manufacturing, is capex intensive. Correct. So I think uh, seeking any kind of investment uh, has a, has different strategies. Now, probably this is not a forum when we can discuss all these things in detail. Uh, but in short, I can say that it all depends or kis purpose So from whom one is asking the finance and what is the objective or the purpose, whether it's a debt or equity. 
और कैपेक्स और वर्किंग सो फर्स्ट वी नीड टू डिफाइन अवर सेल्फ जे किससे लेना है पैसा और किस पर्पज के लिए लेना है नाउ वाइल ए बैंक विल गिव द हाइस्ट प्रायोरिटी अबाउट एनी प्रोजेक्ट अबाउट दिस प्रोजेक्ट वायबिलिटी इन टर्म्स ऑफ पे बैक पीरियड अपार्ट फ्रॉम how much equity the promoter would bring to the business definitely but at the same time there could be another fund house who may look the same in a different perspective let's say many startup companies today if you go by their last 5 years 7 years 10 years uh, financials and you will be surprised and you will be uh, surprised and asking yourself question who are the foolish people in the world who are funding them because they are going raid after raid uh, raid year after year so who is those kind of most intellectual people in the world who are funding them but is important that those people who are funding them they might have a different barometer in terms of their funding uh, requirement or funding objective because they may see the promoter's vision for example your case yan bazar it is a new vision it is a new concept so there might be many people who would love to uh, fund your company because they will find a solid vision in the promoter's mind or somebody will say okay long term market share no problem today this company has a very insignificant market share but the business model is so solid that it will have a very large market share in in future or sometimes even people say okay no problem we know next 10 years we will make a loss we will keep on funding but at the 11th year the terminal value of the business or the terminal value of the brand will be so high that we can uh, wipe off all the losses and we will gain so it all depends upon how we are going to do this but my advice is that potential promoters first have to assess within themselves what sort of usp the product or the service they will be offering so if suppose i want to set up a company or a factory i need to ask myself that kya product hoga aur us product abhi ki dusre product ke samne kya different hoga because that is something that will give me a a proper sales and margin estimation plan for the next 5 to 10 years any trust me any good or unique idea backed up with a solid sales and margin plan will always attract many new investors in my view yeah very 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 well said sir so you know talking about a business uh, there are four fundamental pillars to any business which are marketing sales operations and finance Uh, especially with your experience, what are your views of these four pillars? traditionally हम लोग मार्केटिंग सेल्स ऑपरेशन एंड फाइनेंस इस चारों के बारे में बोलते रहते हैं बट डेफिनेटली आई वु लाइक टू एड फोर मोर पिलर्स दो हजार मे बी सबसेट ऑफ दीज ओरिजिनल पिलर्स बट टूडे दो हजार equally important if not more now which are those four pillars one is a quality and consistent quality that is more important customer servicing that in, includes both pre and post sale service on time in full which we call otif otif and product development you might have very strong yes. marketing sales operation and finance but at the same time if you are not focused with this next four set of pillars which are quality customer servicing on time in full that is delivery and product development i think we will not be able to uh, sustain in a long term because th- there is a reason let me explain you properly step by step so your first thing you asked me the marketing so let me talk about marketing now well there is a very little application of marketing in his original meaning in textile business because most of the people we consider either sales and marketing is the same thing or advertising and marketing is the same thing so that's so very well said sir uh, you know i've spoken to so many people in textiles just out of curiosity if we are one such industry which actually very well interchange both these terms although marketing is is so different 
किसी को डेजिग्नेशन दे रहे हो किसी को लिख रहे हो सेल्स मैनेजर किसी को लिख रहे हो मार्केटिंग मैनेजर बट दोनों की जॉब रोल एंड जॉब डिस्क्रिप्शन सो as i told you that very little application of marketing is visible in textile in the industry uh, because kuch logo ko sales and marketing same lagta hai to kuch logo ko advertising koi marketing lagta hai however the right focus on clear concept of marketing will genuinely help the companies to find the gaps in the market as i told you when you asked me the question about the product launch i mentioned that you have to smell you have to smell 360 degree 360 days in the market what are the gaps what are the pain point now clear focus on a marketing will show you certain gaps in the market they will give you the correct information about the competitors product price policy etc so definitely marketing is important as i want to say but its application has to be very objective kinded not a general kinded let's talk about the next pillar the operation now any focused operation will surely take care of your right quality consistent quality reduction in cost of manufacturing better yield and at least 80 to 9 85% of on time delivery so focused operation has to be there because only when you will be able to achieve those kind of uh, uh, Results in terms of quality, uh, reduction in cost of manufacturing, yield, and better OTG. Third is your finance. Now, we all know that finance is something without uh, nothing is possible. So, finance is definitely is the kind of oxygen for any business. But as I mentioned earlier, that if we have a right business plan, and if our business is a sustainable model with a reasonably good profitability. there is no scarcity of funding also we need to prove that basically but if you want me to select top 2 i would say the top 2 pillars or textile business at least i can say is the sales and the product development now you might you might ask me why these are top 2 now my logic here is that a good sales team can drive a very good top line because in a business you need top line without top line many of the cost fixed cost you won't be able to absorb so you, you need a top line and top line and, and year by year growth will be possible when you have a very good uh, sales team so sales function is very important and secondly uh, the product development because if you do not have a product development and if you do not come up with a new product regularly uh your bottom line will not be sustainable because the moment you create something after one year two year people will copy it there will be more players who, who will offer the same product in a more competitive price you have to reduce your price to remain afloat in the market so at that time there will be pressure on the bottom line but if you keep on injecting new products in the market uh you will always be ahead of the time and you will have a, a advantage of early mover and you can get a better profitability and you can sustain your bottom line so sales and product development for me are the two areas where one has to give lot of importance very well said sir just to digress a little here uh, you know someone who is very passionate about textile someone who like from the heart from the deep end I feel that you know you want textiles to succeed. आपने काफी बार क्वालिटी की बात कही काफी बार. I can tell you from my limited experience in textiles and especially in yarn. Uh, when I look at global manufacturing practice, and again I'm discussing this with you because you are running a consultancy company, and like you rightly pointed out, the difference between you and consultants is that you are operator first. You have been a CEO. You've done those functions, and now you're advising. You know, just someone coming in and saying, "Yes, I can do or yes, I can." Yeah. So, hence, I'm asking you this question. Uh, when we look at global manufacturing best practices, typically every company when they procure the raw material, right, they first test it. If the quality specs are as per expectation, they would consume it or they would reject it. Yeah. Right. In textiles, yarn is a building block for all 
textile materials, right? Rayan's contribution to total product cost is very high, upwards of 50%. Yes. We have seen a very handful number of large companies which actually does this practice. But right. let's say the majority of the market, which is 99% of the industry, for some or the other reason, does not do this. Yes. And just again, up to the doctor wala example, we are more reactive than proactive. Right. So if quality issue came up, then we'll go to a better center, Natira, whoever, and you know, get a test report, and there will be a lot of friction. Supply will say, "Give me Natira, give me a particular one, give me a center." So all of that goes into place. But what has actually happened is that I'm now sitting with inventory of fabric which is defected, which can't be sold in the open market. I have lost my client who was expecting an order after thirty days. So a lot of quality related issues are there, right? We all are aware of it. All as all of us as manufacturers know, the quality issues here, right? In your opinion, why do they exist, and why are we as an industry not proactive about it? Right? Why don't we test it before that? And maybe before you answer this question, now uh, what is the importance of quality for you, and how do you think quality impact can really impact India's? Textile growth, either domestic or in terms of global economic, you know, contribution to global textile trade also. You see, uh, today, uh, when India was uh, or the all the large uh, composite units were enjoying a kind of a uh, freedom because they were protected by government policies, they were protected by international quota and other things. Uh, they thought that whatever we will produce customer will buy it because customer also did not have much uh, global um, ideas yeah. and uh, uh, vision but last 20 30 years today whether you are selling at a cheaper price whether you are selling at a mid price or high price quality mm -hmm. is sacrosanct today no you cannot say when the, your customer will find the problem in your product you cannot say sir i am from bilwara my prices are much more competitive than organized sector. So uh, you should uh, uh, assume that uh, you have to accept a little bit of deviation. Today, those concepts do not work basically. Today, the quality is something which is given. Now, wh whether you are selling at a lower price or mid price or high, that is the first thing. Why? Because today, our end consumers are very well aware of what is happening not only in our country across the globe through internet through uh, 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 google through uh, whatsapp in a second of the time every fashion every new development uh, the knowledge is being transferred and circulated across the globe so today if you have anything shortcoming in your product you your customer will reject it that's the first thing. second thing is that there is a very strong social media. Today, you, you go to a, you have purchased a branded product. You go to the uh, retail outlet and you say, "Look, I have purchased it one month before. Color has been faded." Now, thirty years before, the retailer would try to convince you that you detergent sahi nahi dala, apne jada pani mein dal diya, garam pani mein dal diya, dhup mein suka diya. E wo sab bolke aapse chutkara pana chada. But today. Some people still does it, but today large brands, they take the complaint properly, they analyze the complaint properly, and they have a very strong team and ethical practices also. I know some of the people are very ethical. And if they have a uh, problem with the product, they accept and they uh, compensate the customer. Because today there is a fear of social media. Because if... Every every branded company, every large organization today fear the social media that if our product is not doing well, if we do not listen to the consumer or customer, uh, they can uh, create a very bad story about our company or product. Now, the third point is that in spite of knowing everything, why still it is not being followed 100%? Why we are more of a reactive mode rather than uh, prevention mode? Because the, the only word which can uh, demonstrate uh, this problem is our mentality. You see, the mentality is one word which involves, suppose, aapne kisi ko kaha, jisab, aapko, har month you are consuming 500 tons of yarn. 
why don't you create your own lab of basic four or five parameters to test in-house before you issuing the yarn to the next step? The person will think, now, whether you want to do them blindly, whether you have to create a kind of a maker and checker concept of, okay, they are making it, let me check it. That's a mentality problem because then you might have invested 200 crore in a capex or 300 crore capex. But when there's a time comes when you need probably 50 lakhs or one crore as a capex to test the yarn, which is 60 to 70 percent of your product cost, you say, okay, no, I manage. So it's a mentality problem, basically. Second thing is that most of the time, the suppliers, uh, the weavers get the yarn after waiting of 45 days, 60 days. And our final delivery is 90 days or 75 days. And they are in a, such a hurry and such a hand-to-mouth situation. They feel that even one hour, a one-day testing to result to come, why to waste? Uh, there are, I have seen a lot of cases when yarn is being e issued and worked and after 24 hours and 48 hours, the result is coming, huh, it is okay. So it's all about right mentality and creating a right SOP. As I told you earlier that we do not create an SOP. We, we, we become so involved into the operation and we do not uh, give the importance of making a Bible, our work practices, at the initial stage of the business and later on to make, incorporate, implement, adopt is a big problem. Very, very well said, sir. Very quickly, uh, the importance of yarn testing before consumption. Yeah. yeah. So uh, if I would be an entrepreneur, I would say uh, whatever excuse report my guys are giving, uh, when the bulk yarn comes, I will draw random sample and I will definitely do the yarn testing. If you can tell us more about your entrepreneurship journey, which is the company you've started now. Uh, what does the company do? What kind of companies work with your company? And why should a textile company work with a service provider like yours? Okay. Uh, you see, what are the values I bring to my work, basically? I am a very small time person and a very small company. I do very selective work and uh, sir, so whatever I've heard so far, you, let me tell you, uh, I interact with a lot of people in the textile industry. Uh, the clarity of thought that you have, the wisdom that you have, and the way you're presenting information to some, you know, even slightly complex questions. I think I wouldn't say that you had a very, I mean, you you have a lot of wisdom and very clear thinking. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for your kind words. Maybe I do not deserve those things, but I accept with all humility. So, uh, yes. So, as you say, uh, uh, why uh, and why we are basically. So, basically, what we do is that um, if you see my company, there is a tagline: uh, innovate, implement, and deliver. So, basically, what I feel is that I consider myself as a kind of a doctor. So if any, so what do we do when we get sick? We first take um, our self-medication. Most of the people, 99%, I believe we all know this is for fever. This is for body ache. This is for that. So we do the self-medication and major, most of the time we get uh, well also. So our disease go away. But even after taking self-medication for a few days, when the problem is still there, we look for outside consultant that we go for a doctor. So I also consider myself as a kind of a doctor of my industry. So that is the point number one. Now, what has happened in industry when people work and people like me, they are working, they are much more intelligent than me also. There are people working in the industry. I do not claim that I know better than them. But what happens when a person works in a company 365 days in a operational challenges are so high, the person do not get a very free time to think differently. So when they cannot think differently because they are under tremendous pressure of their routine uh, work, uh, they cannot bring the fresh perspective into the uh, problem solution mode. So my my journey begins there when the company is unable to resolve something internally 
and then they feel there is a need for an outside expert to uh, come into the team, bring the fresh perspective to any solution, to any problem, to their solution, and uh, work uh, with the team, work as a team member with the uh, existing team of the company. So my three key words of my company's logo, uh, innovate, implement, deliver, the means that whenever uh, I get any problem, I try to think at least in a different manner, in an innovative manner. So whenever problem comes to me, uh, apart from uh, the normal thinking, I try to find, gosh, is kis tarah se hum different karte, jo a different result data. So first thing is a innovation in terms of my thought process. Second things, I might have a very innovative idea, but who will believe me, my idea, if I do not show the results? So that my second keyword come into the picture is the implement. So you hire me for a problem. I first analyze your problem. I give you the solution. And then I, uh, if you want, I, I will be available to implement those ideas and uh, to help you to implement those ideas. Then one person can say, okay, you give me a prescription, you give me how to take the medicines, everything. But will you be there till whether it gives a desired result or not? I say yes. So I am a person who will be doing the analysis of the problem. I will be helping you to implement the corrective actions. And I will also stand by with you to see and ensure that the recommendations are giving the desired results. That is the uh, third element, the deliverance, the deliver. So Im innovate, implement, deliver. These are the three key words by which uh, these are my, you can say my mantra for my small initiative and by which I want to do my work. Now, I think it's a great way to describe and I can tell you uh, that a lot of large manufacturing or a lot of large distribution companies of the world Right, they go to consultants like McKinsey's, Baines, and you know, these kind of companies of the world. Uh, if textile industry starts kind of changing their perspective of this is not a cost, this is an investment Correct. which should be done like without any uh, exception. Okay, there is no two ways about it. If we start taking consultancy seriously, if we start, so let me take this opportunity to kind of sincerely request the industry and hopefully to all the listeners who will be listening to this podcast, it's very important for us to get an outside perspective as Sir has rightly, you know, used the analogy of a doctor, right? Uh, we all understand our business very well. We also like to believe that, but you know, self-medication, if you feel you can grow more than what you have done in the past few years, if you have the appetite to grow much beyond that, and if you want an external consultant to come in, Look at your business from an outsider's lens. Definitely would request everyone to reach out to, you know, companies like yours who can really help them accelerate their business. And I mean, it, it's it's not something that, that you know, it has to be proven. I think globally, the mechanisms of the world have already proven that consultants exist and they really accelerate business growth. Correct. And uh, Mr. Yash, I would like to add one or two lines here is that I am not a born consultant. They are, when you hire people like big four uh, people, big four consultant of the world, uh, there are people, uh, very good, high, knowledgeable people. But my case is something different and that's why I am different than those people even. I, I personally feel is that because I'm a person who has started his journey as a shift supervisor and then grown up to the level of a CEO I have got the opportunity to understand the business in a 360 degree. You see, the thing is that one person may be good in one subject, another person may be good in another subject, but God was very kind to me in my 30 years of journey. I have got an opportunity to work in synthetic suiting part, cotton shirting part, uh, home textile part, a uh, domestic market, uh, export market, and also functionally from uh, from a ship supervisor up to the highest level of the organization. So 
what i bring is my practical uh, knowledge of working in the industry almost for three decades and also my ability to connect the different functions uh, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of their result orientedness and in terms of their uh, impact on each other because i think that today's textile industry where margin is very low in general even the slightest mistake by one department can have a very large impact on the overall profitability of the company. So you need to have a balance. It's like a gale me ek moti ka mala mene dal diya. Usme se ek dhaga tootke ek moti agar nikal gaye, to pura kam kharaab ho gaya. Where I feel my expertise because I have been able to manage the business. I became CEO. Uh, at the age of 35, I was one of the youngest CEO in the textile industry as a professional CEO, not as a promoter CEO. So, uh, my, and I was very blessed to have uh, very uh, good bosses in my life and they were very kind and I was being able to learn a lot of things from them. So, that's how I am different that I bring a lot of practical knowledge. Uh, because my growth path was from a supervisor level to a CEO level. Very well said, sir. And if, you know, and so since we've discussed the importance of this kind of a consultancy for all, all the textile companies, if you don't mind me asking and you can choose not to answer this, if someone was, was were interested in engaging with, say, your company, what, how does the commercials work with? You see, commercials uh, cannot be discussed here in this forum, but uh, I work mostly, uh, you see, whenever there's a problem, uh, the potential customer, client and myself, we discuss first the problem and we need to see how much time I personally need to spend on that subject. So the commercially depends upon the kind of a timing, the kind of a hours or kind of a days in a month. I need to spend physically uh, or remotely on that subject. So it all depends upon the time because time is an essence and uh, that's how I work basically. Sure. So is it always like a fixed retainer or is it also a success fee or is it a mixture of both? No, I don't work as a purely success fees basis. Uh, there is a, a fixed fees every month or for the amount of service the client wants to take. And then uh, on top of that, some companies, they fix a kind of a, another incentive as an additional bonus for a success fees. But purely 100% success fees, uh, I won't be able to survive myself. No, no, no. Thank you for answering all this. Sir. This one is out of my curiosity. And I thought that if you know it fits with a segment, then it would be a great opportunity to kind of highlight the kind of businesses that exist, but people are unaware of and the importance of why they should engage with this kind of a company. Yes, uh, let me uh, say one or two lines more here. Uh, whenever you go to a doctor, any, let's say you go to a, a Kokilavan hospital or a Hinduja hospital, for, for a fee, you pay 2000 rupees fees, approximately I'm talking about, for a OPD consultation. Uh, maximum doctor gives you, the main doctor gives you five to 10 minutes time, if you are very lucky. It may be much less also because 90% of the time the junior doctor uh, discusses all the problems and he only briefs. And we feel that it is very costly. Even I feel that sometimes also. But when your problem goes away by paying 2000 rupees, which was restricting your lifestyle, you feel very satisfied. You know, yes, I paid 2000 rupees, but my problem gone away. And uh, so, so then you would feel that it is a very, very, very uh, bargain deal. So, so for a health, be it a business health or be it a uh, your personal health, I think for health, any amount is small. And it all depends upon, initially you may feel that this person, if I engage for one year, he will take from me this much amount, uh, whether I get that much benefit or not. But trust me, that a person of my experience, whatever I have learned 30 years, whatever my mentors and gurus taught me, I have full belief on my mentors and gurus. And uh, 
I'm sure that anybody who hires a, a my service or our service, and if you have a slight patience of six months to one year, the results will be automatically visible for them. Secondly, so, we do not have any intention of sticking to one client for a lifelong. We do not want to be burdened for a lifelong with any customer, any client. We, our objective is to come into the picture, provide the solution, train the people, be there for a hand-holding process, hand over the project and go out. Because uh, we believe the empowerment of the people and we want to uh, train those people in such a manner that in future they are able to manage the business in a better manner. So it's but a short term piece. Absolutely right, sir. Uh, I think so. It's less of logical reasoning, but more of human behavioral psychology. Like I'll tell you, uh, we've looked at a lot of research, a lot of studies, and the results are very surprising. So I'll give you a very simple example. Let's say you were to order food on, say, a Zomato or a Swiggy, and you have two options. Either you get a discount code, let's say 20% off, where the value of the total 20% discount value is, let's say, 40 rupees. Or you get an option B, which is free delivery, where the value of delivery fees would be, let's say, 30 rupees. Correct. I was surprised to look at the results that the survey states that people will offer free delivery and not 20% off. Right. I've spoken to the VP growth and, you know, some of the senior people at Swiggy's and Zomato's on, you know, how they look at their, you know, whenever you're ordering them, there's a discount section and all of these things. So there's a lot of research that goes into it, which actually, so the bottom line is that a lot of times, just sometimes you know, those are like a doctor example here, right? We know it's so fundamentally right. It was a lot of time, they health issue, you know, solve for it, but end up spending more money if I want to go to a smaller doctor or you know, take medicines on my own or do self therapy or self treatment, but a lot of times it's less of logical reasoning or of you know like other behaviors. But just one last question I want to have on your business. So when you yeah. say business consultancy, is it limited to business model certain things or it could be all holistic? Like could it also include like if there is a spinner who wants to increase their output or efficiency or decrease their, uh, their, their wastage, any manufacturer or someone wanting to increase the marketing or sales or, you know, more operational efficiency. So, I mean, is it restricted to certain service or is it very holistic? Uh, you see, uh, my role is more of a kind of a, a strategy and advisory services. So, uh, be it an operational problem, be it a sales problem, be it a finance problem or be it HR issues. Uh, I see the problems in a holistic manner. Then I try to map that problem with the other uh, fundamentals of the company. And then I try to come in and give a kind of a, a list of uh, to-do list to overcome those things. That's the step one. Now, after the step one, the between the client and myself, there is a concurrence that yes this is the way we should take it then we go to the next level the implementation yeah. level in the in, in the implementation level as i told you earlier that i try to build a team with the uh, employees of the client i i do not say that you replace this person with that person or you do this or you do that i try to develop a kind of a uh, bonding with the uh, different HODs of that company. And then we work as a team to implement those recommendations. And monthly basis, we measure the uh, improvement index. Okay. Okay. So, so it's a kind of a advisory. It, it can be operational. It can be finance. It can be sales. It can be HR. It can be production planning, supply chain. It, and it could be because that's the point which I was trying to say is that God was very kind and my mentors were very kind that I have got a different kind of a mentors and gurus and bosses in my life. Someone is very strong in technical area. Someone is very strong in a sales area. Someone is very strong in a finance area. So when we interact and work few years with those kind of a bosses who have a different skill set, 
definitely try to gain insights and gain knowledge from uh, those interactions and you try to build yourself think yourself in that manner so right. that uh, uh, kind of a uniqueness i bring into the industry i my journey started with the production shop floor then i went to the export marketing then i went, came to the domestic marketing then i went to the administrator as a ceo role so i have seen those areas and that's why i'm able to connect the dots very easily right and would you be uh, willing to share a few times and work with you uh, i think that's not uh, important because many clients sometimes do not uh, want to say right. so no no i definitely to be understood sir mm -hmm. acha before we go further just wanted to because we discussed your your current business at length would you want us to briefly highlight or say some of the things we've discussed or would you want to not do that uh mai apni baat ko samajh nahi pa aur ek bar boliye jaise aapke business ke bare mein kaafi baat hui hai samajh mein aaya hai ki aap आपका बिजनेस क्या है तो कंपनी के साथ जुड़ना चाहिए तो बिकॉज़ वी डिस्कस दिस एट लेंथ वुड यू बी ओके एंड वुड यू लाइक अस टू आल्सो इंक्लूड अ स्मॉल सेगमेंट ऑफ दिस डिस्कशन इन द पॉडकास्ट आई इज कंप्लीटली योर चॉइस यस आई हैव नो आई थिंक वी शुड सर आई टेल यू व्हाई आई एम ऑन द इंडियन टेक्सटाइल इंडस्ट्री अगेन एज वी डिस्कस वी हैव सम मैसिव ग्लोबल अपॉर्चुनिटीज विद अस टू बी एबल टू ग्रैब दोस अपॉर्चुनिटीज वी हैव टू रियली वेक अप एंड यू नो डू सर्टेन थिंग्स and very engaging with some of the companies like say for example what you are doing is very very important for you know promoted to mean company to understand what they should do how they should do i also do one more area where i am very strong is that a transition from a typical owner driven company to a professional driven uh, company so because uh, up to certain scale of the business uh, you can manage the business a typical promoter promoter driven but then there is a threshold limit and beyond that one 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 wants to grow further uh, you need to bring into the system and process in place and your decisions should be more of a data based basic rather than a gut feeling basis so right. that then is very critical because I, i have seen as a thumb rule up to 100 crore of business per year in textiles a typical promoter driven uh, formula or the module works very nicely but once you want to grow in the league of 100 to 500 crore or 100 to 300 crore you need to change a lot of your outlook uh, you need to uh, change the way you take the decisions and that is one area where because lot of msmes in the range of 5 crore to 50 crore or 100 crore today are aspiring to be on a 100 crore plus league or 100 to 500 crore league and that point of time those kind of transition is always a challenge for them इंडस्ट्री Uh, i do not want to give very high fi kind of a recommendation or lecture because i don't think those are needed i think uh, always for anything we need to stick to the basic uh, things basically so as i told you i would like to mention uh, three four five points maximum five points here the first would be uh, that any new entry aspiring entrepreneur first they need to uh, give lot of time in finding new opportunities exist in the market many times what happens that uh, uh, we go for a business expansion uh, hearing the story of another successful successful person or in my family in my relatives in my friend circle and we feel that agar usne wo kar diya to main bhi kar sakta hu to main bhi laga leta hu wo company i think that approach is not correct in my view that Uh, if i want to start a textile manufacturing or business manufacturing or trading any kind of a business first i must spend quality time on finding the new opportunities which are existing in the market be it product ho ya service ho be it a physical form or a digital media so that is the first one hour i have probably mentioned many times that th there has to be something talking point otherwise my business Uh, plan is a very kind of a dull and flat uh, plan 
So that is the first thing. The second thing is that textile is a very uh, less margin business. So any new potential entrepreneur must be very hands-on in this business, at least for initial three to five years, because he does not or he will not have luxury of making mistakes too much in these three to five years time. So even his employee does a mistake, ultimately it will impact his dream, his business. So the entrepreneur must be very hands-on in the business. And my personal suggestion to any those kind of entrepreneurs that apart from the routine work, operational work, most of the entrepreneurs, they are very uh, busy in terms of sell side or a manufacturing side. Uh, they should have a time to do certain kind of administrative work also. And one of the area is that inventory and data management. Because in textile, uh, most of the business, at least in the downstream fabric and garment, those are in a credit basis. So focus and quality time on a weekly basis or a daily basis or a bi-weekly basis uh, onto the inventory and data management uh, should be there. You know, because I have seen that most of the working capital gets stuck in this area only. Third point is that I always say that if you have an ambition, um, like you probably, I can say that of young professional who have an ambition to grow the business, you should identify the right professional's talent at the initial stage of your business. You should recruit them, retain them, grow them along with you and try to build a core team. Why core team? Because tomorrow, when you will be a faster growth path, this core team will take the bigger responsibilities to manage the business. That day, through the lateral hiring, you might hire some people, but those people may not understand the business ethics, principle, ethos, which these people can understand because those people have grown uh, from your initial days. The fourth point is very important where I feel most of the textile companies are lagging, uh, especially in the uh, unorganized and semi-organized sector is the is to create the right SOP. Now, many times we start the business, we manage it, and then after a certain scale, it becomes very difficult for manage, and uh, we find a lot of difficulty, and we try to create the SOP those point of time, but it is too late by the time. I believe that the rule of the game must be made, documented, evaluated, studied, sealed, stamped like a Bible before the initial first invoice to cut or first project to uh, the foundations to lay down. Because later on, you will be so busy in the operational, you would, will not have to make this kind of standard operating practices and policies, be it a sales side, operation side, HR side, and other things. Along with the strong MIS, you should also look for a right IT system to generate effective MIS and for the right decision making at every stage. As I told you that still in our industry, people take the decision on a mostly on a gut feel basis because they do not have a right IT system, right kind of a smart reports, MIS, to take the, to study the data and to take the report. So to take the decision. So that is the fourth point, the SOP and proper IT system for effective MIS. And finally, my most favorite is the very strong eye on a product development side day in and day out. So these are the five things I believe that any entrepreneur should follow uh, and then things will be much easier for them. I think great advisor, all five of them. And Dr. Yeah. Fokia, we know it's very tangible, it's very imperative. The lack of data is like shooting in the dark. Yes, yes, yes. And which is something that we've seen most of the industry, you know, doing in textiles. Yes. So yeah. thank you so much, sir, for sharing, you know, your wisdom with your insights and your experience with us. Especially the last five pointers, I think, you know, very, very great points. Uh, you know, just a small fun section I would like to do with you, if you don't mind. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you could have any superpower, what would it be and why? <laughs> Gosh, I have superpower. But if you could have what would you want to have? 
And on a serious note, uh, you see, I think if I had any kind of superpower, I will do all possible efforts to protect our mother earth uh, from climate change, deforestation, pollution. And also, I probably I will ensure that uh, a total social harmony beyond caste, religion, nationality. So those kind of atmosphere, definitely, I would say uh, the world is very peaceful from the climate point of view and social point of view. Very noble thinking, sir. Very noble thinking. And if you could live anywhere in the world, where would you choose? And again, why? Ah, uh, here my answer instantly is India. Uh, the reason being is that yes, many times even frustration we say uh, the infrastructure of Dubai <laughs> is so nice, infrastructure of UK is so nice, and all these things we keep. Singapore is so nice. But I still feel, um, feel that uh, India is one of the best place to live. Very frankly, I have traveled more than 40 countries and repeatedly, repeatedly in my time when I was very active in the sales and, and marketing part. Uh, but honestly, I want to live in India because I feel that there are many advantages in living in India. First, our rich cultural heritage, our freedom of speech, our democratic approach, family bonding, social values. Now, those are the things, five, six things, I uh, never found so predominantly. Uh, maybe some places you will find one or two very strongly. But all those five, four, five, six points, which are very essential for living a life, any place, uh, those things are very visible in India. And I would like to live in India. Nice. And I can see you're a very sensible person. I'm sure, you know, Hello effect with you is very, very high. Uh, if you could wear only one fabric, only one fabric for the rest of your life, which fabric would you choose? I will never wear one fabric rest of my life. <laughs> I like fashion. So on a serious note again, uh, it all depends upon uh, uh, the uh, my way of wearing uh, any kind of a fabric or any kind of dress. Uh, basically, it depends on season, occasion or type of at air, the occasion is demanding. So uh, let's say in a summer uh, and in a casual look, my preference would be a linen and cotton kind of a stuff because uh, I feel those things are much more comfortable to wear uh, in within the air-conditioned room as well as the outside. But if the uh, occasion is a more of a formal kind or we are traveling to a winter place, definitely I, I love to wear suits. So uh, good quality of polyvinyl fabrics would be my choice. Since you've spent 30 years in the industry, and of course you've done your, your uh, education and then joined the industry. So from your childhood days, if you could have a choice to get one of your favorite fashion or textile trend back to fashion as a comeback, <laughs> what would that be? Oh, let me think. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe uh, I would uh, like to go back to 70s or 80s for a bell bottom pant and bobby print shirts. Maybe those things. Um, very fashionable. Well, those days. Something I can say, I also wore. So there was a time when I think around 2020, Russian made a huge you know, entry to Bollywood and he started taunting bell bottoms. And I remember those are the same period of our generation. I'm 91, so 90s kids, maybe. Wait, type as bell bottoms Yes, yes, yes. So I, 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 I think you see. Yes, in those days, in our eyes, the bell bottom was looking fantastic. Um, as the fashion changes, our eyes changes. Uh, today, if we look at those kind of uh, pants, we look, we start laughing. But I feel in those days, in seventies and eighties, uh, the kind of impact this kind of fashion element like be it a bobby print or be it a bell bottom pant those kind of impacts uh, as a kind of a paradigm shift so i really want to go back to those era and like to wear those things and kind of a uh, have a feeling of those eras thank you yash for uh, considering me and giving me chance to speak out my mind and heart and I thanks listeners uh, from the bottom of my, my bottom of my heart that uh, they are quite they have listened my conversation quite patiently and my all the very best to everyone in the industry uh, for a very successful year ahead. Thank you very much.
all the very best to Yan Bazaar and you and all the team of the Yan Bazaar. They are a very young team and my all very best thank wishes you. for grand success in the coming days. And thank you so much, sir. I am a phone call away. Thank you so much, sir. Take care, sir. Thank you. God bless you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.